Hello everyone, uh, this is Shruti from Document360, the co-organizer of this webinar. Thank you for joining the session today. We are thrilled to have you all amongst us for this webinar. We have Mark Wentowski with us today, who is an API documentation specialist and a senior, te uh, senior technical writer with over 11 years of experience in writing web-based documentation that helps API developers to explain their solutions to various audiences. He'll be speaking on the topic, documenting GraphQL APIs versus REST. Thank you, Mark, uh, for accepting our invite and coming here to share your insights on the topic. In this session, he'll speak about GraphQL versus REST API and how each type exposes data and their fundamental differences in terms of their architecture and how their query mechanisms affect what needs to be documented. After the presentation, Shakir Hussain, Manager Product Management OI, moderate the QA session. We encourage all the participants to key in your questions on the QA platform here so that our team can collate and hand them over to us. All right. Yep. So today we're going to be talking about uh, documenting GraphQL and uh, in particular, how is it sort of different from REST. So we're not going to be covering a whole lot about REST, focusing mostly on GraphQL. I think a number of you are probably are familiar with REST so far, so I think it's a pretty good topic. So why learn uh, GraphQL? Uh, well, there's a few reasons. It's uh, growing in popularity. Um, companies like GitHub, Spotify, uh, Twitter, Shopify, Pinterest, they're all kind of uh, creating GraphQL APIs or they're, they already have them. And uh, Stack Overflow and JetBrains uh, sites like that are showing metrics that show an increasing interest in it among uh, developers and business, business people as well. Uh, for, for yourself, if you're a technical writer, so it can help facilitate communication as it's sort of this schema based approach where it's sort of the single source of truth and your documentation itself can be a single source of truth. And that sort of acts as like a contract between front end and back end developers, your, your, your documentation and the schema. Uh, next as a tech writer is the ability to write interactive examples, which is something that uh, GraphQL's tools kind of allow you, allow you to do. Um, and then you can allow the readers of your documentation to test queries and sort of explore the API directly. Something that's maybe a little bit more challenging with REST. Uh, the last is uh, enhancing developer experience. So um, GraphQL really has a focus on developer experience as part of its the design itself. And um, by creating um, quality documentation, I'll definitely like even more improve the developer experience. So it's a good opportunity there. And just in general, it's a skill that's probably going to set you out because not a lot of people are, have experience with GraphQL um, as tech writers so far. So yeah, it's definitely a good area to kind of look into. And uh, kind of comparing uh, the two. So starting off, so well, I guess what are the how what are the similarities? So they're 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 both approaches to designing APIs, different approaches. Um, and and the main way they differ is they uh, have a different way that they structure data and then how you request data, clients request data from the API is, is different. Uh, they're also something important that are not mutually exclusive. So um, as I was kind of mentioning before, uh, most companies won't have just a GraphQL API, they'll have a REST API, usually that came first, and then they'll have a GraphQL API that's either a layer on top of REST or it's uh, both APIs are available through an API gateway, for example. So they complement each other well. There's different use cases for both. Some client apps are more suited towards REST sort of endpoint structure. Um, other ones, you know, prefer the flexibility of GraphQL. We'll kind of get more into that in a minute, though. So uh, REST, uh, just as a quick summary, is just it's architect architectural style for building APIs. Uh, it's, it's aimed at networked applications, which are basically applications that communicate over the internet. And um, you, when you interact with the REST API, API, you're passing these sort of CRUD operations, which are these sort of create, update, delete sort of things that you're doing to the data that you're sort of like you want back, you're requesting or you want to change in the system. So it's, uh, you know, basically uh, endpoint based, uh, which you can think of almost like an endpoint, it's like a URL uh, that allows you to um, you know, access these different resources, basically, uh, which are you know, basically data objects. So one thing that stands out is that uh, it's strictly defined, some strictly defined data structures. Uh, you have to request um, things in a certain way, uh, the way things are uh, ordered and formatted, and, you know, 
things, things like parameters have to be a certain way of the order. Um, you know, the request body is a certain way. Uh, there's not much flexibility with it. Uh, kind of going on to uh, that. So yeah, endpoint based. So what we're kind of looking at here is um, Swagger UI, which most, most many of you have seen. So Swagger UI is basically referred to as Swagger. It's just a tool used to interact with uh, REST APIs using sort of a web interface. And this, this is sort of the Swagger pet store, which is kind of an iconic REST API. You kind of quickly see based on this, uh, the structure of REST, it's, it's just basically a whole lot of endpoints. Some of those can be hundreds or even like, I've seen like a thousand endpoints of just different URLs basically that, you're, that are you know the endpoints. And then each of those endpoints might be the same endpoint, but it's a different CRUD operation. So like, you know, post, delete, those are all different different operations. So it's a, it's a huge, it's a huge, you know, list of uh, URLs basically. So like when you look at the document. So, um, so that's the first, the first point is REST is endpoint based. Uh, the next is it's uh, fixed and structured. So right here, I kind of opened up one of those endpoints and uh, it'll kind of replay in a second, but I'm basically creating, uh, you know, adding the data here. So ID, I want to retrieve a, a pet with that certain ID. And then in that data that I'm providing, it has to be very structured. I can't put that ID below the category or below the name. It has to all be there. And then the API dictates what information is returned. In this case, it looks exactly the same as what's requested, but you, you don't have um, access to, to, to sort of change that. So, okay, so GraphQL, let's contrast that with GraphQL. So GraphQL is a little bit different for us. It's a query language uh, for requesting data. So as a query language, it kind of obviously allows you to build queries, why it's called a query language. Um, and a lot in those queries, you're able to specify the, the structure of the data that you want. You're not um, limited to sort of like a predefined uh, structure of the data. Second thing is it's a schema based approach um, for client server interaction. So client server interaction, how it works is just clients requesting data from the API server. And it's based off a schema. We'll kind of get more into what the schema is basically. The schema is basically sort of like the equivalent of the open api spec sort of but it, it's it's sort of uh it's, it's a bit different we'll get into that in a second though. so if there's one word to kind of uh describe graph graphql would be flexible so uh what we're kind of looking at here is uh the graph eql uh tool which is the main tool for sort of exploring graphql uh apis if you have if you have a graphql uh schema then you're, you're able to sort of use GraphQL to sort of represent that. It's, it's sort of similar to Swagger in that it uh, will produce, um, it's a, it allows you to try out the API as well as give you documentation. So pointing out what's, what's different about GraphQL. Um, so it uses, it only has one endpoint. So before we saw the whole list of endpoints uh, for the REST API, and uh, that endpoint's actually hidden. You can't even actually see it in this interface. And uh, it only uses, uh, the post HTTP method, HTTP method, uh, whereas before with REST you had, you know, you had get, you know, post, you had put, and actually like a lot more. Uh, so it's it's actually simplified by just having one endpoint and one method, and uh, basically what you do is you construct queries. That's on the left side, so you can, uh, you know, construct queries using the query language. So you have to follow a specific language. Um, how to do it. it's pretty simple to do and uh basically you can rearrange any of the fields in that query ta and tailor the response is the important thing is that the query itself is a you're you're telling it exactly the the structure of the data that you want back in the response which is why it's so flexible whereas before you were with rest you couldn't rearrange any of those properties you had you basically had to request it in a certain way and you receive back it in a certain way so that kind of demonstrates the sort of the flexible nature of it. So we'll kind of get a, get into one of the, the main uh, conundrums when you're particularly with REST, where these are the these are the shortcomings uh, that GraphQL is actually meant to meant to address. So it's, the two main things were uh, why can't I get all the data I need in one request, and that's uh, called underfetching. And then the opposite side of that is uh why do you have to get all back all this day i only want a subset of it um so that's that's kind of something that 
is uh, kind of frustrating about rest and it, it could lead to a whole lot of issues, but uh, we'll kind of get into exploring those topics a little bit more. So let's take a, uh, like a fake blog API. So this is sort of just a basic API for managing like blog posts. Like, uh, you know, each, you know, a blog is going to have like posts, it's going to have user details. It's going to have each, each, uh, blog post that's have comments. So, um, yeah, so this is what the, the spec would look like basically for rest. So for under fetching, so let's say that I'm going to go use this API, like I'm, I'm yeah, building a blog app and the API is like the interface to get the data and stuff like that. So example of under fetching would be if I want details for like a specific blog post and its comments. So with rest, looking back at the, uh, the spec I'd showed you. So basically I know that I need to send this sort of first request to get, uh, passing the ID of the, the particular post that I want to get the information from. Um, so yeah, that'll give me the post details, but, uh, I can't, I'm not allowed to get all the com the, the comments. I can't request that in, in the same request. So I'm forced to actually send the separate request to sort of the, it's like the same endpoint, but it's up with a slash comments on the end of it. So what that will do is return like an array of sort of common objects. So point is I have to make two, two requests with that. So if I, if I look at, so say that that same rest API was implemented in uh, GraphQL. Um, so I'd be able to fetch basically what I need to on one request. So like on the left side, you could see in the request, I can construct a query and I'm sort of specifying this, what's called a type. So the a post would be a type and then under that, so post has a set of properties that I'm allowed to request that are sort of part of that post. So I'm basically specifying that I want the ID, title, content, when it was created. And then I can also say that I want the comments for uh, for the post, basically ID, text, created app. So it's going to retrieve that blog, blog post and the response. It's going to give me that information about the post I want, and it's also going to give me the comments as sort of this uh this array of, of objects like first one like great post second one's like thanks for sharing and so forth so forth like that uh the other one is uh overfetching so that's the uh that's the other issue is that say i want specific user details of a blog author for example um so i would send uh, a request to the uh, slash api slash users pass the user id and then i get the uh i get the user sort of object but all I wanted was the email and the bio. I don't want any of the other stuff. Well, with REST, uh, the person that designed the API said that, nope, you, when you send this request, uh, you're going to get this entire object back, uh, which can lead to increased network traffic and all sorts of other bad things. So uh, if we look at that, how it would be implemented in GraphQL, uh, I would create a query, and then I would basically pass the ID to the, the user type. Then I specify within the query that I only want the email and the bio. And then in the response, I get basically the information I need, the email, the bio. I don't get anything, anything else that I uh, uh, didn't want. Okay, so moving on. So documenting GraphQL APIs. So uh, we'll kind of distinguish the two, I guess, categories. So the first one would be field description. So this would be the equivalent of what you what you would used to seeing in like the Swagger API. So uh, this would be things for like the, the schema itself, Types, mutations, um, uh, introspection queries, stuff like that. Queries, and uh, basically, you're what you're looking at here is uh, the, this is basically GraphQL. This is the same interface I was showing you before for GraphQL, and then there's a docs uh, button or a pane on the very right side. And once it resets, you'll, you'll kind of see it in a second. So yeah, right there. So on the right side, you put docs. And then you open up, and so the, the first page is the entire schema, and you can drill down into queries, and then you can see the different types, and then you can basically analyze it, um, you know, the, the different types of arguments you can do. So it's all kind of available right there for you. So how would you actually go about editing it? Oh, and I guess uh, this, this kind of leads you uh, to the impression that maybe this is something that's edited in like a health author authoring tool, uh, help authoring tool but it's actually not, and we'll kind of get into what exactly it is. Uh, so like in reality, you know, as you can see under the code comments, this is what, what it looks like to actually document a uh, GraphQL schema. So you're actually, 
Uh, the, the one on the left is the primary one with the code comments where you're adding these sort of like quotes and then right above the property that you want to um, describe your, you're adding that description in. So that's like the, one of the main, but that is pretty much how you document um, fields and so forth in it. Uh, but there's other, there's other ways to do it. I, I'm not, I'm not the biggest fan of uh, code comments or code annotations. I feel like it kind of makes it kind of messy. As you can see, it's just like, it can get really out of hand with all those comments. Uh, the other ones I want to talk about are different options. So I've seen where you have Google Sheets where you actually manage uh, the descriptions in a Google Sheet, and then there's some sort of script that will basically import uh, those fields into uh, the schema. Um, I, and maybe I forgot to mention this. So the code count, that's the actual, actual GraphQL schema is on the left. So the end result would actually look like the first code comments thing, but you would manage the data in Google Sheets. And that's also something that's kind of good because um, maybe some people may be uncomfortable with like editing, um, you know, like code or, you know, doing sort of like the sort of like syntax like that. Most people are, you know, used to using Google Sheets. And it's also really easy to track progress on completion of fields and sort of all the different sort of project management things you get with using Google Sheets, you can do that with your sort of API field. So I've seen that kind of be kind of successful in my experience. The last thing I wanted to kind of touch on is uh, something that uh, is kind of interesting with, so you can have like a separate uh, file, um, like a JSON file or YAML, YAML file that that's that would be the location where you define the fields. And I feel like it actually, it's a, it's a lot easier to manage like that. So you would also, in that case, have a script that sort of imports it back into that first sort of code comments, sort of the syntax or whatever. Um, so it's something that, that would be a bit tricky to do. You'd have to have some kind of validation to make sure that your uh, definite your the structure of your your JSON or YAML file adheres to the, to the schema and uh, different things like that. But I've seen it. These are all things that are within the realm of within the realm of possibility. Okay, moving on to the uh, conceptual docs. Uh, so these are things like get started, user guides, you know, use cases, code samples, uh, just any kind of tutorials or, or pro what I call pros. Um, basically, you can use any tool that you're already using. So that would be knowledge bases, help authoring tool, help authoring tools, and static site generators. So that pretty much all of that's fair game um, as far as documenting that. And um, you know, it just depends on how flexible the tool is as far as sort of you know keeping your uh, your field documentation, what I just, what I just shown, you know, up to date with your conceptual docs, or maybe it's some kind of automation that needs to happen to sort of ensure that those things stay up to date. Uh, sometimes those are, uh, sometimes those are flexible in that way. Sometimes they're not. So you have to kind of see what's available. So now I'm going to kind of move on to general, uh, general tips for, uh, documenting GraphQL APIs. And I'm sort of focusing on what makes it different from rest. So I'm not going to cover, I'm not going to cover a lot of the basics of like rest, you know, like, you know, conduct user experience and stuff like that. Yeah, you, you need to do all that. You need to do developer experience. You need to do, you know, all the sort of thing, requirements gathering. Um, so, okay, so moving on. So like single endpoint. So, um, you know, you need to emphasize sort of that. Yeah, it is a single endpoint. It's not, it's not like rest with all the multiple endpoints and provide sort of code examples of sort of like sending queries to, to GraphQL using, uh, using library. So that that's where that URL would come in play. You couldn't see it in the graph EQL, but uh, when you when you're configuring an application, you would need to have some guidance around how to send queries to that to that endpoint. Uh, the next is sort of on the on the query language focus aspect. So uh, the basically um, you know GraphQL is kind of new, so you you need to communicate you know actually a little bit about what GraphQL is. And uh, sort of its key features, because that definitely will impact, you know, how the documentation is used. Probably don't want to repeat too much information. Maybe reference official documentation for certain things, but then leave things specific to your API and, and, and your docs. So uh, basically, you know, compare GraphQL to traditional REST APIs. Maybe like the equivalent thing, almost kind of like what I showed you before about, you know, comparing uh, what a request looks like in REST versus GraphQL, and because uh, most people are coming from REST and uh, you know, and it's also kind of a, a, a strategy thing as, as well, as far as like getting, you know, adoption for your API, because um, uh, it, just having a GraphQL API can be competitive uh, for, for companies that maybe there's a competitor that has a similar product, but they only offer a REST API. 
GraphQL, if you offer that, then that can be a competitive advantage. So that's something to highlight in, in, in the docs. Uh, the next is schema documentation. So, uh, you know, basically you're going to want to uh, provide sort of concise explanations for each type, uh, which would be kind of what I showed you before. So like the blog API posts and user and comment and uh, document fields like with data types and the purposes for each type. Uh, describe the relationships between the types. So, um, you know, like relationships like a one to many between post and comment. So you can have one uh, one post with many comments. So you want to you want to document that. GraphQL supports a, a lot of times, as I, I mentioned, that tool uh, GraphQL is very important. Um, sort of maybe even do like a tutorial on how to use even GraphQL. Probably, it, but it, it wouldn't be just a general. It would be uh, a general tutorial would be, you know, how to interact with our API using GraphQL, something like that. So that in itself could be like a little tutorial. Um, yeah, and then access instructions and, you know, testing examples. So that's all stuff that tech writers can help with. Uh, query variables. Uh, so, you know, basically describe the concept of query variables. And, uh, you know, basically it's like where you see with the ID there, like passing an ID and uh, provide examples, demonstrate how to use them, and uh, different queries and so forth. Introspection queries, this is something I think that's really, um, is really something good for tech writers to get in while because it's just because it's open-ended. So uh, basically introspection is, is a big topic in GraphQL. So it allows you to query sort of the scheme itself. So not just do queries where you're querying different, you know, specific things like posts or comments, you can actually, uh, posts or something like that, you can actually query, you know, the entire API, which is like the entire scheme that you can kind of explore that with introspection. So sort of offer examples of queries for developers to explore the schema so that, 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 that that's like a huge uh, thing you could help out with. Um, that's not something that's like machine generated. Um, and that would be case by case, you know, basis. So explain what introspection is and uh, provide examples uh, in the API. And then it's it's also good to have like, you know, interact, make it interactive where possible. Uh, next is security, which uh, sounds kind of boring, but it's it's actually pretty, it's actually pretty important. It's definitely like um, it's uh, it's it's actually a really big topic and it's something that definitely tech writers can help out with. Um, you know, as far as best practices to avoid avoid exposing sensitive inf information, it turns out there's like tons and tons of opportunities uh, for applications to expose information they didn't mean to, and uh, particularly, uh, you know, with companies that were using GraphQL before or GraphQL API, uh, it's really important to provide those security uh, standards for them. Um, just kind of gives you an example of actually where you can accidentally uh, pass like a password or something like you can get a password back, which is definitely it's not something that would be uh, good to do. You never want to expose that sort of information. So you want to show different strategies for for, you know, like storing sensitive information or different ways of um, creating your application to, to have this sort of security um, uh, considerations in them and make sure that they're covered. Air handling, so that's, that's, that's really important. So uh, it's, it's extremely important as um, explain the structure of error messages. So just the entire swath of all the available error messages, error messages that are possible in the, uh, in the system and uh, not only not only just showing sort of the what is this error response whatever number mean, but uh, documenting common like error scenarios. So these would be like particular particular use cases that can happen, and then how to handle them. And then there could be whole like articles on you know what to do in those situations. Like supports like a huge a huge topic, and it's it's ripe for help by tech writers to do that to help with that. Uh, the last two tutorials, so this is another another big area. So sort of describe scenarios uh, that users can do an example of a post. So like um, user wants to create a new post, basically, and then uh, provide like a step-by-step -step guide uh, for interacting with the API and the, with an emphasis on practical, sort of practical scenarios. So like an example tutorial could be, you know, you create a, create a blog post and then, um, you know, you're explaining the purpose 
Uh, the muta mutations, basically, you're, you're creating something in the system. In this case, would be creating a new block. This is almost like the equivalent of a post in REST. And you're kind of breaking down the different elements of the, of the request, that how to construct a mutation query uh, with, you know, with different placeholders for the variables. And you show them, like, you know, where to enter the variables. Talked about the query, query variables, as said, and then how to execute the, the, the mutation, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, read the response, basically. So explain the structure of the response, how to re interpret the, the data that comes back, you know, and then even further than that is like, what can you do with your application with that? And that's sort of where you get into like coding tutorials. This, this would be more of a tutorial for functionality, um, which are really important. Um, and then the next, the next step would be coding tutorial where you show them actually, how do you actually, how would you build this in your application? Um, like what are the different things you can do? So that's all, that's a whole other area as well you can get into. Thank you once again, Mark, for the session and all your contributions to the technical writing community. On behalf of entire Document 360, I thank everyone who joined the session and hope it was a great session for you all. We'll be back again with yet another session very soon. Thank you. Goodbye.